Okay, I just started the recording. Sure. Yeah. So we can share that after the meeting. Um, <clears throat> for those that join us online, welcome. And we will get kicked off here. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. We will uh, get kicked off here. With a, we have we have some new stakeholders. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bivens is joining us for the first time. Um, with this stakeholder group, we've got some some new faces have joined us in the second or third meeting, and a few of you have, have been along for the ride uh, the entire time. So we'll do a little bit of kind of getting people up to speed if we can. So just just to quickly um, summarize the stakeholder group effort. So what we intend to do is take some big ideas, and these are these are more the what and not necessarily the how exactly. Um, the how will get reviewed more. Um, but the what is we'd like to recommend some updates, um, maybe with the zoning ordinance, possibly stormwater design criteria, and present those to council for consideration. So to start this effort, um, Claire Davis, who is now uh, in a stakeholder position, he and I worked with a couple of consultants to do some case studies. So what we did was we took existing um, watersheds that had been studied, and then we we leveraged those and, and applied a few parameters to see specifically in an urban area, um, how is impervious cover being studied and impacted by these small developments cumulatively coming in for infill and redevelopment. And then also the other study was a suburban kind of riverine type watershed, and that one was more focused on valley storage so this flood natural flood storage natural detention within this within the river system itself so so last time the bulk of the conversation was we we came up with a big picture recommendation for valley storage and so i will touch on that briefly um and then we're going to really talk about impervious cover so i didn't want to mention the stormwater website does have a section with cumulative impacts where it kind of quickly describes what that is. And also we're going to put the meeting minutes from from these meetings on there. So general public can take a look at this stuff and and kind of see what what's the city looking at right now. So. Our, our valley storage recommendation. So this is again the what. Uh, the what is we are recommending that we do proposed regulation of of valley storage. So so right now, um, outside of the Trinity River corridor, so West Fork and Clear Fork, we don't we don't regulate volume at all, uh, flood flood storage volume at all. So what we are recommending citywide is that we start doing that. Um, and so what you can see here is this bulldozer on the left, they had they put some fill in. Maybe that's to uh, reclaim a few more lots, um, take advantage of the acreage that they have. And so what, what they would need to do with this policy is they would need to possibly make some cut either on their side or the other side of the stream to compensate for the fill that they put in so that they can uh, so they can maintain that storage within that within that reach. Um, so this could be so when we get to the how 
It could be, you know, what does that reach look like? But this is pretty much anyone adjacent. So I'll, I'll kind of summarize um, this. But right now in the city of Fort Worth, we like to we like to look at the big, big storm. So that's a big hundred year. But also we look at the smaller, kind of more frequent storm. And at, in the city of Fort Worth, we currently regulate the one and the five year storms as well. So what we're proposing for now, and this can be, you know, debated more and reviewed and discussed. But for now, what we're saying it would be we, we keep continuity. We say consistent with with what we already doing and say the valley storage would also apply to the one year and the five year storms. And that's kind of to help prevent flooding, but also help prevent uh, erosion in particular areas. What is the threshold for when you would have to implement the valley storage good question good question so so that i'll i'll discuss that so that our, that's our second bullet point so so the policy would be no loss in that flood storage volume so what we found is that in one you know just one project losing that storage really you 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 may not be able to tell the difference but when you do another development and another development and another development, though that loss in valley storage adds up and causes impacts downstream to the folks downstream. So the cutoff right now, what we do is um, we ask folks to look at the fully developed condition um, when they're mapping. So like a floodplain easement. Um, so that and that goes up to a 64 acre drainage area. So that we're talking natural streams. Um, and so so we kind of thought, OK, to stay consistent and not be confusing and reinvent the wheel, we would use the same same cutoff. So 64 acres, everything. So pretty much anywhere where you would map a floodplain easement um, would also kind of fall into this. So so you're not trying to preserve every puddle on your site and look at really small things and get really into the weeds and confusing. Um, this would kind of maintain consistency. So if it shows up on a plat as a floodplain easement, that's kind of the area we're looking at. So these are stream riverine type areas. Um, the third bullet point is it's going to be citywide. Right now it's just the Trinity River with all the other tr uh, communities that they're uh, participate in the uh, corridor development certificate program. So, so the, th uh, the fourth bullet point is, is uh, it would be implemented through the floodplain ordinance and then, and then written into the uh, a future version of the stormwater criteria manual. So, and then lastly, we would, we would present this to DAC. We would present this to um, Mayor Pro Tem Bivens is, is part of the uh, Mobility infrastructure, infrastructure Transportation Committee. We would like to present to them as well, get feedback from them and, and other staff and consultants, engineers to review, poke holes, refine um, these policies. So, so right now with this stakeholder group, it's kind of like the what, and then we can further refine. So our goal is to be able to present something to city council by the end of the year and at 24. And so this is kind of a big picture, like what we talked about is, do we need to do something or not? Uh, we, you know, there was the do nothing option. And so in, in past meetings, we said, you know, we, we think it's important. We looked at the case study that we did and said, you know, we need to do something. So this is the proposal for now is, is we'll do something, try not to reinvent the wheel. So leverage our existing criteria. So those are kind of the highlights for now as far as valley storage. Um, did anyone have any? We last time we discussed this. This could add, you know, some burden to the development community as far as additional study, uh, maybe additional review time because there's more things they're submitting to the city for review. Uh, Misty is one of our third party consultants with Kinley Horn. We talked to her when they they do currently review some. 
valley storage calculations for those that you know projects that are in the Trinity River corridor. She said, you know, that doesn't really add any additional burden, you know, like your review time or anything for a flood study. So is that did you want to add anything that yeah, Misty? I think we this approach, we would probably ask the applicant to present that type of information of how they're balancing what uh, the compensatory storage is. You know, maybe provide a table so it's easy to check or in the RAS model, whatever we do. Okay. Um, just ask for that information to be readily available, and I think the review would go quicker. So that they're actually doing it, they're aware yes. of it, presenting the findings. And I think where DAC and some of these other consultants, I know that Travis and Larissa had had talked about us making it very clear up front what the expectations are so that they're not having confusion on their end and what to submit and that yeah. there's very clear communication between the reviewers and the city staff and, and the consultant applicants. Um, so those are things that we can discuss further, but I think for now, um, those are things we're kind of anticipating. Um, there could be some loss of lots where maybe they can't fill in as much floodplain as they wanted to. Um, so, so that is one implication. There could be a few lots that just have to get preserved. So, and one of those, have you yeah. looked at the impacts? You know, there's a big impetus right now within the city to try and figure out how to spur more in town development more urban housing, more affordable housing, and and those more urbanized areas are more apt, even at 64 acres, that's an area that's more apt in town to be totally flows into the pipe yes. box as opposed to a more suburban development. Yeah. And looked at the fact that any negative impacts potentially on 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 that more urban in, in, in field. town redevelopment efforts. I, I yeah. don't know. I'm just here. I, I, I didn't miss the last meeting. I replied I couldn't go. No, that's great. So the question is, you know, how, how could this, with the 64 acre drainage area threshold, how could this impact some more urban and infill areas? And I think the answer is, unless there's a natural channel in those areas, it's which is unlikely at this point because they're all filled in and underground, it, it really won't impact them. Um, so that that valley storage is really more for our suburban new development that's going on, you know, in, in these undeveloped areas for the for the developed areas. That's where. And so that's a good segue here to the. Uh, to talk about impervious cover, so this this is where. This is where we're struggling more, so I think the valley storage thing is pretty pretty easy to understand and pretty clear, you know, it's it's not going to be a huge feat for us to do that. And it's and it's pretty standard across every major city in Texas. So we're just kind of stepping up and doing the same thing that's done in, in many cities across the country. So, sure. Yes. And I know this is broad and overall. I only know of one specific development, so I'm going to name it, but not for you to respond to it specifically. Uh, in my district, I have Lakes of River Trails. That's Ken Newell's development right off of Trinity and 820, where he's built so far 3,400 homes. They're not zero waste blocks, but they're real close. And so for a development that is still underway, uh, would they have to come under you know, regulations with this new and if that's the case, I'd be concerned about enhanced uh, responsibility and I'm sure yeah. the council members would too. And the, the other question is, I'd like to get a copy of the case study. Yes. So that that was uh, something I, I will do after this meeting. I'm going to send I've sent I've sent it to a few people. We've had new new stakeholders and um, I'm going to send out those two case studies to everybody. I'll send a link today to everyone to download those and look at those. So the question um, is, you know, what? how does this affect um, some of these developments that are ongoing and building now? So, so the answer is, so let's say we presented something by toward the end of the year, 20, you know, 24, um, that takes a while to go work its way through it's like DAC and and uh, MITC and some other groups and staff review. So 
so by the time that wouldn't ex it wouldn't impact any any existing projects um, if there's like many phases and by the time this makes it into the ordinance let's say next 20 spring of 25 early 25 um, let's say we implement a valley storage policy by then. If if a if a phase has or a, a project has ten phases, maybe those last two phases do have to look at that. So we would look at those. Each phase kind of comes in as a separate drainage study, um, and so they may have to look at that. But if it's already approved, they've done a drainage study and under construction. Definitely would not have to comply so with any. I think it would be tied to planning when I, those I, plats come in. I think it'd be yeah, yeah. So that's a good yeah. question. If they already have a plat. Yes, that's which what I was saying. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Has right. entitled a piece of property. They've got its own, gotten it preliminary planted, gotten all this water, sewer, drainage, traffic studies improved through the city with a preliminary plat. And then halfway through the development, you change the rules. That can be quite problematic, yes. especially when all these downstream improvements weren't designed with whether it's the impervious cover or the valley storage. Uh, I think that's something we need to carefully consider because that that could, could create some real problems. And very frankly, I mean, the, at some point, I mean, I know you, there are certain things that can be changed the best uh, under rest of rest statute, and certain that cannot. I don't know where this falls legally, but even in the spirit of the things, the city has said, yeah. we bless this development, go ahead and build a neighborhood here, and then halfway through, you change the rules. Some of this could have some pretty significant impacts yeah, so on, on existing development, so I would suggest strongly that, that the, the staff look at grandfathering and things like that, because you know there's going to be that push at some point with the implementation patient phase the developers going to ask to so get so, anything approved to be grandfathered under the existing yeah. standards. So for those online, the suggestion is anything with a preliminary plat that's been approved, you know, they would not need to comply with any new valley storage regulations, which which does really make sense because what'll happen is they'll come in for a, a conceptual kind of master plan and they will do a drainage study based on all their phases and most of the time detention volume is addressed during that preliminary plat and then when they come back to final plat they have to resubmit a drainage study that's got all of their final stuff but at that point um you know the 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 detention and the volume and that kind of stuff is it's really already been set in place so so that'll be something we can discuss definitely more but that is that is the seems to be the consensus that you know, if you've got a preliminary plat approved and you're halfway through that, you know, we we implement some ordinance halfway through your project that, you know, you don't need to, hey, change the rules on you. So I like the way you said the spirit of, you know, the spirit of it. Yes. So great. And I think that's one more. Sure. And, and this involves <laughs> the need for the presence of punitive action. Uh, for example, I have a business owner in my district who has done some, I'll just use the term manipulation you know, of the link. And that has resulted in legal getting involved and you know, they're working through that process. So you know, what happens when you have a non-developer you know, who is impacting value storage and doing things that shouldn't be done? I don't expect an answer, but I think you should consider that because I would think I would not be the only one. Yes, So good point. Just putting that out there. So it would be well. It, so if somebody has done done it without any permits or done it correctly, then that does come into an enforcement action. Um, and it's not just the developers that have to follow the rules. So anybody that's coming in and doing any work would need to still follow the same rules. We do that with the infill, or like people are just building a home, they still have to follow all the same rules that everybody else does. Um, but yes, if they do it wrong, then it's enforcement action. That's a whole nother we process. Out back in 2018, when the heavy rains came. Yeah, I think I know which, which one you're talking about because I'm working on some stuff on that right now. So, <laughs> and I'll go, the, the Lakes of River Trails one, that project does have to follow the valley storage because it's along the Trinity River. So it is in that 
corridor, uh, CDC corridor, okay. and does follow those, yes. those regulations. Um, but yeah, that's a good example of a very large, you know, mini phase project. Um, so there, there are more of those coming and yeah, there's more. Yes, there's more enforcement coming. So, <laughs> but, yeah, but I think, yeah, I think we should have like an implementation plan, uh, kind of like what Development Services has done when they've changed the submittal for IPRC with the change in the state laws. So I think we could do the same for this, and that could help alleviate some of the concerns that developers have about okay, at what time do I have to start actually following this or not, mm -hmm. and where I'm at in the process. So we'll look at that to you as we get more detailed. Yeah, so. those are good. Those are good points and suggestions. OK, so. Um, and just. I'm going to send out a memorandum that summarizes all of these recommendations. And if if anyone thinks of things after the fact, we can implement comments or incorporate those into the uh, recommendations but this next section is really kind of part two of two things we wanted to look at and that is impervious cover and that is really more impactful in in our more urban redevelopment infill type areas so so what do we mean by impervious cover um this particular graphic kind of shows you the yellow are the impervious areas and then the green are are pervious so if you notice like a swimming pool that is considered impervious um certain decks though are could be pervious because the water can you know drain through there and go into the soil below so and one thing and this is where i'm really hoping that we can get maybe some feedback or input from our zoning folks um, because when it comes to zoning, most municipalities that I've looked at and I've done quite a bit of benchmarking, we don't we don't refer to it as impervious cover. We we uh, we refer to it as lot coverage. So we're so the idea is we're talking density. So when you're doing city planning, it's how dense is a particular zoning district. And so when we're talking city of Fort Worth, if you look in the zoning ordinance, you don't really see anything about impervious, allowable impervious coverage. What you see is lot coverage. So I'll, I'll show you here what exactly do we mean by lot coverage and how does that translate to impervious cover when we're talking about stormwater. So just kind of a quick recap. I circled in red, if you kind of working your way clockwise, starting at the top left. That's that's an undeveloped area, so approximately 10% runoff with the rest kind of either evaporating or going down into the soil. When you get some less dense housing, top right, 20% runoff, and then I guess moving down bottom left is more of like our, well, I'd say A5, more dense. Um, 30% runoff and then our urban areas kind of inside the loop type areas where you're looking at, you know, dense townhomes and then, you know, commercial, industrial, up to 55% runoff. So going from 10% to 55% and how do we deal with that? Um, so I'll talk about how do we deal with that in kind of each of these scenarios roughly uh, in Fort Worth. and what what if anything do we need to do to improve so so here's an example of some infill uh, redevelopment what we had are single family homes on that left lot the middle lot and the right lot are kind of what it's turning into so much less grass much more rooftop patio sidewalk so um that's just kind of an example of infill, an example of of what residential redevelopment would look like. This is a pretty unique case here, but this is the TCU area. So you see this is the same neighborhood on the left from 2009, on the right this year, 2023. Um, I would kind of focus on these 
parking areas in the back versus kind of backyards is what it used to be. So that particular area does have some flooding issues, existing flooding issues, and this is one of the reasons why uh, Stormwater started looking at this issue. You know, what, what if anything should be done about that? Is it okay? I think in this particular case, the zoning was, it was rezoned from uh, B to uh, PD, where it was allowed, you know, for that more dense um, housings. But again, that's pretty, pretty unique. There aren't, very, <laughs> there aren't very many areas that look like that. But that's kind of an extreme example of, are we okay with that? Um, are, are they okay required to do a stormwater study for that? Oh, okay. Good question. So Stephen Murray just asked, are they required to do a stormwater study for that? So each of these, if they are under one acre, they do not. So each of these lots appear to be under one acre. Um, Michael, I don't know if you know the history of this area. I don't think we saw any drainage studies for the any of these. So it's kind of comes in if, if you're kind of lumping them together in your project and you've got a common plan of and it crosses that one acre threshold, then you would need to do one. But in this particular area, um, in this this situation under one acre, uh, no. And I don't think any of these uh, had a study done. So that's an example of kind of residential redevelopment. And then here's an example which is in Mayor Pro Tem Bivens uh, district. So just kind of show you, and this and this is very typical across the country, a new subdivision comes in. What you see on the left were a lot of trees, a lot of grass, which is replaced by housing, um, si single family. I think this is a five. Uh, where, where is that? This is Mockingbird Estates. Off of Randall Mill is the kind of north. The city's actually doing a big project there to realign that. I'm sure you're familiar with that one. Um, and that's also going to fix a couple of spots that are flooding downstream. So I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, OK, so so how are we handling this now um we're handling it in a very similar manner that almost every city across the country and the world handle it so we have this one acre threshold that if 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 you're platting more than an acre or you're disturbing more than an acre um you need to do a great commercial grading permit and you need to do a drainage study and so what is your drainage study that is for the peak discharge for those three storms I mentioned earlier, year one, year five, and your 100-year storms. Um, we do not regulate volume, the total volume of water. So this is standard practice, and, and this is a pretty hard concept for the non-technical like resident person to understand, especially if they live downstream of a new development. So what happens is when new development comes in upstream of them, your, your regular run of the mill thunderstorm that comes in and drops, you know, an inch of rain, right? That's less than a one year. A one year is, is like two and a half ish inches um, in Fort Worth. And so if it's less than that, it's going to produce more water coming from subdivision. So you're downstream and you're looking at the creek next to your house and you're seeing more water than you used to. And that's definitely going to happen. What what's hard to understand, though, is when the big storm comes and it produces the same amount of flooding that it would have produced before that development, they just see the flooding and they say more water was coming it flooded it's just it's got to be because of that development and the, and it's hard to get past that so the perception is they caused my flooding the reality is our stormwater criteria manual doesn't allow them to make your flooding worse in these bigger one five and hundred year storms so 
So there's a, a perception versus reality thing um, because of the volume. Now, there are certain cities and the federal government, um, they, they are trying to regulate some volume. So what they'll say is, OK, your site has to capture somehow the first like inch or so of rain. Um, that's what the federal government does. They have this thing called the ISA 438. And they say any any federal project with a footprint of 5,000 square feet or greater has to capture what they call the 95th percentile storm. And that's a brown one to two inches of rain. And they have to capture that on site and treat it. It's got to be the same uh, runoff water quality and volume as, as pre-developed back in, you know, 1500s or whatever. Uh, where? To, to the maximum extent feasible. So what I found just from benchmarking other cities like New Orleans, for example, New Orleans is one that's trying to implement this, but any single family or small, um, like if it's less than six units in, a, in like a plan development, they are totally exempt from this and then even after that they recognize that it's just not doable um and so through like green infrastructure or some you know they just can't accomplish that so so they'll let them pay a fee to uh bypass so it's it's basically like hey we can't get it done here's you know write a check so i can only imagine how many checks are written, are written. <laughs> just because it's yeah just yeah, just like, it's like, hey, you, know, you can't do it. Here's your check. So that is an option. So that's something I'm going to present as, you know, possible recommendations. Do we want to go with that? Um, OK, so. As mentioned, um, everything less than one acre is not looked at. Almost all of the infill development for residential is less than one acre. Almost all of it. Um, so there's there's something that we have looked at where we've done really detailed studies and found like if there's an existing flooding issue even if it's less than one acre we're going to identify those and we and we call them city flood risk areas this is another effort that claire really spearheaded we're about to uh, go to council approval here in the next month or two um those particular areas we're saying you can't make it worse basically you can't make it worse so if it's in one of those areas or in a FEMA sump behind a levee, which is a few areas, then you can't make it worse. And we actually are going to regulate those even if they're under one acre. So the third point here is we do offer um, fee credits for if you can implement a, a BMP, a best management practice for a stormwater quality device, or some kind of green infrastructure that would reduce your volume. We're all for that. The stormwater criteria manual allows for that, and you can get some fee credits for that. Um, however, most most developers uh, don't take advantage, like almost none. I mean, Misty, would you say how many have you reviewed? Fourteen. One or two in the past several years. So, so <clears throat> it's really not. It's an incentive, but it's not being taken advantage of. Um, and then I guess the downside for the city is if it were taken advantage of, then we're <laughs> then we're bringing in less revenue. Um, so if everyone took advantage of it, it'd be great and it helped solve some problems, but then we'd also be losing a whole bunch of our revenue. So, I mean, there's kind of double edged sword there. So, so I guess just to summarize, we are doing now even without the city flood risk area regulation, we are doing pretty much on par with everyone else in the country, aside from some places that are really looking at um, stormwater quality stuff. So the place like Austin, where they've got the uh, Edwards Aquifer recharge zone, they really want that water to be cleaner once it goes back down into the aquifer. So they're looking at it. There's some coastal areas uh, like uh, Chesapeake Bay, for example, Juliana here did a lot of reviews for developments going there, and they had to look at stormwater quality. And that's kind of not part of this discussion, but it, but it did tie in closely with uh, impervious cover. So, 
So here's just a couple examples. So what most people do for those peak discharge is they will build a detention pond. So this is an example of a detention pond, which actually also doubles as a ball field, soccer field. It's kind of cool that the city built. Um, this is at a uh, Central Hills High School. Um, so that's helping. That's kind of a regional detention um, option as well. I have a question. No, you're good. You're great. I, what what tweaked my interest to come was the frustration of a constituent of mine named Bob Horton. I don't know if any of y'all remember Bob. He, his, his biggest thing was, okay. <laughs> and so you know that that's what really made me want to come. Now, what I'm going to tell you is not in my role as mayor pro tem because I don't speak for the entire council. But when you give me New Orleans as an example, you know. Sure, they had a lot of problems. I think everybody in that city is crooked still today. But I would hope that what you're doing is not just to tide us over now, but think big, you know, think long range, you know, think what's going to be happening five to 10 years from now. Because Bob started mentioning about the cumulative impact probably 10 years ago, and we're just now getting to this. And so, you know, nobody's going to hold you hostage or Take away your first born if you have a big plan. But I would just ask you, please don't be timid with this. Okay. And Great. That's you, you. You have to be able to know that council is going to get pushback on any and everything. So by all means, be bold in what you want to present. And I will support any bold idea, knowing that we'll probably have some. I, I'm sure Karen will show up. But just please don't be timid. Because this is very important. Great. That that's good. That is good. That's a good uh good to know. Um and, and I will talk about a couple of options that are kind of big picture that would be a pretty big overhaul um, if we implement it. So I just want to show on this one last thing on this slide. This is a mapped city flood risk area. Just south of downtown at the top, you see Vickery, uh, Hemp Hill, and we've got developments coming in all over the place right here. Um, some of those are hitting that one acre threshold, so they're getting reviewed now. Uh, Michael Crenshaw is reviewing a couple in this particular area right now, and they struggle to do what they had planned to do, knowing that there's a whole bunch of water flowing over land in a big storm. So it'll be interesting to see how it works when it's under one acre and they don't have as many resources, maybe. How do we deal with these areas? But that's something we are willing to work work through to help people not flood and not flood their neighbors. So what what percentage of the land or the area that we're talking about already consists of impervious gutters. Do we know even or because I would imagine it's gonna be different, you know. It is. It yeah, it's different. So dictate decisions and choices yeah, to make. I'll show you a slide here that kind of gives you some percentages given a certain kind of zoning district that are estimates. And before I get to that, um why, why, why are we talking about it? We've got a stormwater criterion manual. It's been updated a couple of times. We seem to be doing what other municipalities are doing across the country. Um, we have a stormwater stakeholder group that meets with us um, every year. And several of those folks have expressed concern, specifically kind of in the Magnolia area, McCarthy area. They're saying, hey, you know, more development's coming in, but we're we're flooding already. Like, are y'all going to fix, you know, re replace all the storm drains? Well, no, we don't have enough money to do that. Well, what are you, what are you going to do? So it's like, well, maybe we need to take another look at this and get creative. Um, so one thing that was noted is, is that the, in the second bullet, the allowable impervious um by zoning and subdivision ordinance 
is it does not we're underestimating it in certain cases in our stormwater criteria manual. So that's one thing that our case study found. So they took an existing study that was kind of in the near west side Linwood area and they they looked at okay based on what's happening in there and what the trends are you know are we accounting for that and the answer was no we're, we're under underestimating the amount of runoff and the volume so so the first kind of sub bullet point there is uh and that comes from the subdivision ordinance so so right now for residential you can pave your entire backyard whether that's a pool patios concrete whatever you want to do you're allowed to do because that is not included in lot coverage which i'll get to here in a second that is impervious cover and then you uh by ordinance 50 percent of your drive uh, front yard can be a driveway so so we're talking you know a good chunk um in areas with an hoa or neighborhood association that's harder to uh accomplish right they're keeping a closer eye on their neighborhood typically if you want to do put in a pool you want to do this and that you're going through some approval with your neighborhood association your homeowner association and they they kind of self-regulate what what do they want in their neighborhood if they know there's flooding in their neighborhood do they want that um for for the city staff what was brought up with with the zoning folks is like how do you how would you even regulate that? Like, how would you enforce too many people putting in pools, right? Or too many people making a parking lot out of their backyard? That's difficult. Um, the newer the newer subdivisions, we're not seeing big flooding issues. They're having to, the, the storm drains are bigger. You know, the road crossings are bigger. Their, their newer latest design criteria we are not seeing issues in those areas, aside from we think we can looking far into the future with the valley storage. Um, but but as far as storm drain design, they have to do some pretty darn uh, extensive drainage studies before we allow. Stormwater is like always the last approval, it seems. So Leon is very familiar with that and we have pretty stringent standards. So the last bullet point here is we just do not have the revenue to upsize every storm drain system in these areas that are developing so rapidly with infill and redevelopment. So that kind of brings us to, you know, these are some of the areas that we had been getting complaints about and concerns about. You got Cartberry on the top right, Central Arlington Heights on the bottom left. Uh, near West 7th on the bottom right. And then um, Linwood area flooded about a year and a half ago. And they've they've seen they've had a couple of scares since then. So so um, Michael had a question about uh, how you know how much impervious is there. So our stormwater criteria manual, this this table on the left. So you've got different land use types, which are pretty much zoning. And then that second column is the is the percent impervious. And I'm going to zoom in on the very bottom here in a second of that table so you can see kind of what number crunching went into the actual impervious percentages. But one thing that our case study did find for some of these urban areas is that there's explicitly not impervious percentages stated in the manual that we may want to add. So it's kind of people are left to, there's some judgment call being done there um, if they do need to include some of these areas. And so to make things consistent, do we want to, do we want to add some of these specific zoning types? Um, okay, so, so I mentioned zoning and stormwater criteria. How do those kind of correlate? So the top, here, this table 3.5, that's a zoomed in version of that table we just saw on the left in the previous slide. So basically what it says is um, current development standards for minimum lot size and maximum lot coverage. So the lot coverage comes from our zoning ordinance. Um, 
And then they do some estimations and they say of that coverage area, 90% runoff and then 30% runoff for the grassy impervious areas. So what, so the bottom is the, is the definition I pulled out of our zoning ordinance for lot coverage. What exactly does it include? What doesn't it include? It's really just the footprint of the house. Um, doesn't include sheds. Um, it doesn't include any overhang, it says sheds, arbors, um, overhangs, uncovered patios. So like pools, all those types of things are not included in lot coverage because from a density lens, that's not, that's not what the concern is. You're looking through a density lens. So in my benchmarking, I looked at, um, one community, University Park, who they were really getting concerned with the kind of McMansion thing going on in their city. So these old kind of more historic homes were being replaced with these huge footprint homes. And so they ended up kind of redoing their ordinance. And I think Dallas, and I didn't actually follow up, Dallas was with them at kind of doing the same thing, but they were looking at rather than just strictly lot coverage they were kind of saying hey we want like maximum impervious cover to be included in our zoning ordinance so their zoning ordinance you know specifically calls out impervious cover not just lot coverage so it's kind of both density and through the stormwater lens i guess so that kind of goes back to like do we want to look at that does it matter do you know, are, are we okay with us taking the zoning and then sort of making a, a comparison or a kind of uh, calculating that into our stormwater, you know, design? Um, or, or would we like to look, change, you know, take another look at zoning? Um, from what, yeah, yeah, good. Go ahead. So the initial zoning when an application comes in, you could control it then. How would you control it when people want to do add-ons? Would that be through the building permit? Is that the part you'd have to add another process to catch it and manage it after the original? On that's, a good, one that's a good question. Stephen, maybe you, Stephen Murray, maybe you know the answer to that. Um, that's where zoning. So if, if someone has like a specific zoning and then they want to come and do an add-on, which is going to add lot coverage, how how's that looked at? Yeah, they would have to get a building permit and um, at the time of building permit, it would get routed to our zoning department for review. So that's that's typically how it's done. And if it exceeds the lot coverage for that zoning district, they just say, "Sorry, you can't you can't do that add-on." Yeah, or they have the release valve of board of adjustment, or possibly rezoning, depending on the okay. situation. Okay. I can see some frustrations being where you think you can add on things of your private property and then you get close. So then, I mean, it's kind of interesting and, and let me ask with the view of zoning and coverage and then the view of stormwater. And it's it's sort of two things we're we're talking about. Would would they be maybe this is what you're asking, would they be kind of going forward in sync with one another terminology and rules and policy or could they be separate but one trumps the other one or one overrides the other one in other words zoning says yeah you can do that you can build that but stormwater says no nope, that exceeds our policy and can they exist in layers where one oh you know the, the most strict one wins right or and that but that might be confusing i think especially if i was a small builder or a homeowner Mm -hmm. I might think, well, I don't know what that means. I mean, and if, and if listening to this, I'm thinking if the terminology was all the same and the rules were synchronized, the policy was synchronized, it would just be seamless, right? And I mean, in a perfect world, the zoning coverage world would match stormwater and any other city policy, you know, layers that go on to projects. So that's a great point. So <clears throat> there's a couple options. It looks as if University Park, for example, they changed lot coverage to impervious cover. And so it is one in the same. But 
So like for Fort Worth, if you scroll through our zoning ordinance, every zoning type has a lot coverage and it'll have a percentage. Mm -hmm. So we could do lot coverage and then add a line for maximum impervious coverage, and that would be a different percentage. So you're both looking at density and stormwater within the same, maybe that's a way to do it. I don't know. Yeah, uh, we should probably think about think about this a little bit more, maybe um, as a side. Like, would you have the zoning folks, like, during the permitting process, well, let's start prior to the permitting process. This is reviewed at the uh, platting level. So whenever we get to the building permit process, would you see the zoning folks reviewing the impervious surface, or would you want stormwater reviewing every single permit? We would have to talk kind of through these yeah. types of different things. <laughs> Leon, Leon just volunteered to. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, like, I like the idea. I think it's, um, yeah. it's a great yeah. idea. Uh, yeah. But we we would just kind of have to go through how we would do that, and then what I think a little bit more education from kind of how University Park does it would be probably helpful. Yeah, and and maybe how they do it's terrible, and everyone hates it. <laughs> so so that's that's a that's a thing because not most from what from the benchmarking I've done, and I can provide that to everybody with with this memorandum that I that I provide. Almost everyone does it very similarly to what we do. They're concerned about setbacks. They're concerned about how big of a structure is on a certain size lot um, because they want that overall big picture. And if you're adding in a stormwater and you're sort of mixing and zoning, that kind of muddies the water a little bit. Um, so yeah, would that be an added a, you know, workflow in Excella that stormwater folks take a peek at, but that's a whole lot of extra work it, it may it's not it be more efficient for everyone, not just SDS staff, but actually the applicant. If whatever we decide is presented early in the process, right? Because we don't want to get to, you go through all your zoning, and even though it's somewhere it says the higher stringent, you know, code would apply, we don't want to get to the end and storm order is the boogeyman, right? You say, no, you can't do that. Well, that's not going to, it's not gonna it's not gonna promote development. It's, yeah. it's gonna make more confusion. So I mean wherever we end up, I think it needs to be as I mean, cohesive in the front end, right? Where the zoning matches stormwater criteria is personally what I think, whatever that looks like. Uh, so we keep that in mind as we as we go through this. Um Yeah, that's a good point, real quick. I wanted to jump yeah, in yeah, and just say that like we're not like for these existing platted lots we're a lot of time we're not seeing it till the very end zoning isn't because number one the the lots already platted so we're not reviewing a preliminary plat associated with it and number two it's already uh zoned properly so mm -hmm. we would only be seeing a lot of these lots in these specific areas after at the building permit level so yeah, I, I don't know uh, another way to catch them, you know, maybe at the pre-development conference, but not everyone does a pre-development conference, especially for a one lot single family right. home or an R2 uh, attached home. So, yeah, it's something we need to, to consider. And I think to add to that, someone who wants to add a pool is not going to do it, you know, right away. They may, might be the third owner. And, and they don't know any of this stuff. And they're just like, hey, I want to put in a pool for my kids. And it's like, how would they know that? And how would we review that? Especially if it's under one acre, because right now under one acre, not in any of these flood prone zones, it's not looked at by stormwater at all. And I think one more quick note, I guess, again, listen to this. Recently this summer, West Flyers out in Louis version. A homeowner, and, and I'm I'm realizing now that what happened is pretty much this discussion, kind of by accident. A homeowner said, "I want to build a carport for to share a carport in the backyard or driveway all the way to the back." Decided he did not need a permit, as he knew what he was doing. Poured the concrete up to the property line, right in the slab, all the way to the property line. Built a structure real fast within about a week. 
the neighbors, and this is these are older areas, right? Homeowners association, um, not homeowner neighborhood associations, and they're a little bit older areas. So the houses tend to be like 1930, 1940. So a lot smaller, a lot smaller houses. So squeezed in the carport. Um, the next door neighbor said, "Oh, gee, that's really close." It's like started looking at it, realized it was on the property line, um, and very close. Uh, so the neighbors were smart enough to figure out, go to the micro work out, file a complaint. Uh, because one of the neighbors had talked to him and found out he didn't have a permit. The zoning commission brought him in before it just about two months ago to review all the plans and said, you can't do that. There are ordinances, you need a permit, and you have to follow the rules and have a setback for these structures. The next door neighbor, the, the other neighbor who was sort of drove the complaint process was we built this big structure the first rain that came along, the rain hits the roof of the peak and it goes right down and it's going pretty full force and it goes on to the next door neighbor's driveway and floods into his house and then to the back and the front and up and down the driveway. Now, a lot of this was because the guy didn't get a permit and maybe had he got followed rules and had a permit, that could have been stopped before it was ever a problem. But now there's a concrete slab for two or three cars and a big structure. And his own commission said, you got to move it and you got to put gutters. And so it's sort of, I'm realizing, sort of highlighted the importance, of course, of zoning and setbacks and all the couple lot coverage. But the zoning commission, the neighbor who filed a complaint also was looking at it like, well, yeah, you didn't get a permit. You're on the property line, but you're also creating a water problem that just went from his property to the, the innocent neighbor's property. I mean, and those... All of a sudden, you, now that's not really impacting the flooding in the neighborhood, like the big pictures we saw that one guy's structure in the wrong place, but it created a real problem for the immediate next door neighbor and lots of stress and having to be confrontational with a neighbor and four or five families that all around him, front, back, and on each side came down to the meeting for the um, zone commission. So. I mean, those are in, like little micro cases, right? It's not a macro neighborhood issue necessarily, unless everybody does that. And I, I think that might, in my mind, gets back to like when we go back to talking about 100% allowable impervious in a backyard. What if everybody, what if 10 houses all did 100% covered impervious in the backyard? I mean, it sounds like that's allowable right now. So, so our. Our case study did look at that. It did look at that. It's Central Arlington Heights is is residential. Yeah. And it did and it did make a big impact. Is that likely to happen? No, yeah. but but the but the, the exercise was what would happen? Like this is what we allow. What would happen if they actually did it? Right. Um and as I was just explaining, even one property with where the structure is and I mean he basically took the impervious coverage away from the property boundary right I mean maybe you could argue he didn't increase impervious because he still got some of the other well he did when he poured the concrete he increased but it's where he put it as well I mean had he put the concrete pad in the middle of his backyard with impervious all around the property boundary maybe the next door neighbor wouldn't have cared right yeah, but because it was on the property line, the location of the impervious coverage just kind of seems to make the whole thing a little bit worse. So, in your example, let's let's say he did do the setbacks and got the permits, <clears throat> which he could probably do. Sounds like unless zoning didn't allow for that. But let's say zoning did allow for that, and he did the setbacks. Um, we get stormwater gets a lot of complaints for that type of situation. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is we can't do we can't do anything because what they did was allowed and permitted, you know, by city ordinance. Um, what's not allowed by Texas Water Code is that you know they drain water onto their neighbors, and so it becomes a civil matter. So that that's what we have to tell them is like the city is powerless to help you, but you know you're gonna you're gonna have to go do this civil court or whatever, which is unfortunate for people, but that's that's really it. But if we did have something like this, where it's like, oh, you're in a zoning district, because this may be 
how it would be enforced is <clears throat> not so much in the permitting phase, but like after the fact where it's like, well, they already had, you know, they were only allowed 80% impervious and he did 100%. And so it's like, hey, you need to go remove some strips, you know, to prevent flooding. I don't know. But but anyways, these, like Stephen Murray saying, this this is, um, they're, it kind of is a big, they would be, it would be a big thing to try to change, to try to change this. So okay. that's okay. <laughs> Man, program business is okay. So I have to leave, but I'm at a disadvantage. Can you have everyone self-identify so I don't hold it real quick? I yes. just want to hear your name. <laughs> that was a horror story, but I don't know who I'm in the room with. Yes, I I apologize. I should have done that. It's your first time. So Ben Thompson was Storm TPW Stormwater. Lisa Biggs, Flood Plain Juliana Barron's TPW Stormwater. Larry Davis from the Fulton Plan. That's like your life to work for that week. I'm Barry Gorman from the Vice President of the Monticello Neighborhood Association, and I'm from the Moss. I can show up to you, Debbie, in this DS. Michael Whitson, I'm just a citizen, volunteer, interested stakeholder here at downtown Portland. Don Allen, a real estate developer. Ethan Sergey, I'll change. And this is Christian with Kimberly Warren Engineering. Leon Wilson, Development Services, Stonewater, and my wife is from England. Yeah. When I heard your comments, you know, in response to Stephen from Zoning, you guys treated this like a hot potato. It's like, okay, nobody wants to do this. But what I will tell you is, you know, be mindful of the budget process schedule. And as long as you can get you know, people crazy enough to come down and give comment, you might be able to influence staff changes. Because it's obvious it is gonna it's gonna cost, but it's for the benefit of the citizens. And so you know, I never let cost keep me from raising hell about what's gonna benefit the you other know, people. So thank you for letting me come. I have to go. I'm okay. not supposed to be here anyway. And Ms. But Bivens, I'm just gonna let you know online we have uh Royce Hansen with our legal team, uh Travis Clegg with Westwood I Consultants. Travis is on. He's been he's been in this is his first meeting. He wasn't with us. Stephen Murray is with zoning. Uh, Stephen Nichols is our stormwater program manager. Who, uh, with the accent, yes, right? yes, yeah. he is. And, <laughs> and uh, Tom Davies <laughs> with Hillwood. Uh, uh, yes, Tom Davies with Hillwood and and Hunter uh, Teal from LJA. I want to just acknowledge you all, especially the private sector. Uh, nobody works here at this time of year. That's why I like to come because nobody knows I'm here. <laughs> For those of you who know, I got real sick after the Netherlands. I've got to go do some more blood work. I'm not even contagious. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for joining us. Be studying and everything you said. And please send me invitations to every meeting you do, and I'll come when I Absolutely. Meet. And I was real nice. I didn't bring Sandy. I'm not Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> That's my right hand, my partner in crime. She is celebrating the holidays. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. 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 Thank with the impervious stuff, especially talking about the sample, like it's obviously a much more of an issue. Over older developed areas with smaller spawn rates, much more designed, much older criteria, those types of things. But we're focusing on residential here, but honestly, um, in town neighborhoods developed things like that. There's a lot more interface, frequent interface between neighborhoods and commercial and non residential uses. And I suspect you're going to have the same impervious cover questions with and issues with non residential yes. uses as well as residential uses. You know, a guy needs two more spaces for trucks to park, things like that. He's, you know, just, so it's it, 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 the in town or the urban drainage thing is the 
seems to be the focus more the problem solving with this, then you need to focus comprehensively. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Residential is a problem, but it's it has to be more than just residential. Address. Absolutely. In some cases. So. And, and when it comes to commercial, those are more likely to cross that one acre threshold to where they are, they are having to do a drainage study, but there are a lot that don't, um, to your point. And so, so this kind of brings us to, and this is where I wanna close, um, here, here's some potential recommendations that we can think about, shoot down, um, totally rule out, it's, it's, up to, it's up to the group here. So, so the first one being, you know, do we just kind of, continue as is, but adjust our, our engineering assumptions to sort of increase what we think the impervious is to closer match reality. Um, that that would be that could be, you know, in addition to other things, but I think that's definitely something that we should look at. Um, for sure include some of these um, Zoning district impervious covers that we don't have in the manual now. That's a, that's an easy one. The work's already been done. Um, so just just kind of try to bring those two more in line with reality and and the design criteria. So the second one's the big the biggie um, that we were just talking about that um, I think is a big a big thing to do if we were to do it. So so that's yeah. just the zoning ordinance. Yeah, can I, Steve, can I step in here one more time, Ben? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think uh, adjusting the zoning ordinance is doable. I just uh, think, I mean, I, don't, I think uh, it would just be something we'd have to work with. And then we'd also have to consider, like, you have your Euclidean zoning, like your A's and your B's that are just straight residential. But then you have our form base and MU's, which are more, you, you want higher density, um, buildings and things to that nature to where um, you're not having a lot of impervious surface because you're infilling the site with more dense type development. So those are your two things uh, that we would need to consider. And I think if we just maybe adjust the lot coverage um, and maybe not get into the impervious surface like discussion, then my zoning planners that are reviewing the the building permits can just look at it from a zoning lens so we would just that way the the stormwater folks wouldn't have to look at each individual permit we would just adjust the lot coverage Percentage. definition to to include language that helps suit y'all a little bit better if yeah if we can get um approval from city council so okay yeah, but we would just have to work on it okay so yeah that's why i'm i'm very glad that you are able to join this this meeting in particular because that's that's really i think that that's really the crux of if we do something i think it would have to at least take a really hard look at, at zoning um so so like to address the we we are encouraging dense development in certain areas um they're wanting, you know, the infrastructure's in place, water sewers in place. They want the density to come closer to downtown. And city council has been approving a lot, you know, rezoning areas to encourage this. And in those areas, it just so happens that of the infrastructure, the stormwater infrastructure is not capable of handling this change, this infill development and redevelopment. So, so in the meantime, you know, one one option, which I'm not super in favor of, would be to try to do what New Orleans or Chicago or some of these cities in California, uh, Minnesota are doing, where they're where they're trying to do either some kind of micro detention or some sort of on-site mitigation. If you are going to go dense, do you capture some certain volume, one inch? with green infrastructure, a green roof, or rain barrels, or, you know, pervious pavement, which I don't think works very well. So they're looking at that for like certain areas of the city. There have been studies. North Texas has clay soils. It does not infiltrate like at all. And so a lot of these green options 
are tricky to implement, which is why they're elected, you know, elective. They're optional here in Fort Worth. We don't have a, we're not doing water quality. So what what are y'all's thoughts on, you know, some kind of on-site micro detention or green infrastructure, low impact developments? Just a maybe a technical view of it. Um, if you looked at like a like a one inch rainfall or what's a typical rainfall in parts of the city in in a year, how much what volume of water is that and what size containment would it take to hold that? And it's a nice idea and I like the micro on site detention, but if the structure or the device that it takes is so big that you can't hold one inch rainfall, which happens four or five, six times a year, then it's going to be this big, ugly. I'm just going to say you got a big steel tank in the backyard, and I don't want to look at a steel tank in my neighbor's yard. So heck no, that's not practical, right? So it, it so it really depends. But if it's a small structure like a rain barrel or things that gardeners use and, and landscaping, and I can't see it, it fits in nicely. You know, it's I guess that has to be practical, right? It's yes. Not only from an expense standpoint, but it's we have done be able to be to fit in a on a property. What 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 do y'all what does anybody else think about? Does, doesn't the city of Austin already you know some of their high rise? I mean, because we're talking it sounds like anyway, more of the development pushing it into downtown, very dense, you know, the runoff uh, creates all kinds of problems, and some of the high rises. And I know in Austin and in other locations have the ability to capture water and then they actually reuse it in green areas on rooftops and some things like that. Now, I, I don't know how effective and what the impact is, but is, is that an option with, if we want continued development going on in downtown Fort Worth? That, that is an option. And we do have some of these form-based code in these specific zoning districts where that are more urbanized could would it be worth trying to implement those things those ideas in just those areas maybe it could help i know austin does have like water quality and if you drive over there you see a gas station on half an acre and then the other half an acre is like this ugly pond thing that is treating water and it takes up a lot of space so to, to bernie's point it, it is that feasible the the looking at new orleans they are trying to capture the one one to two inch on site with micro detention or green infrastructure they've got the fee in lieu which i would imagine happens more times than not where you just pay an, uh, and basically an impact fee um which may or may not cover, help much because, so let's say for example, you're doing infill and the lot was already 60% impervious and your new development, all you're adding is another you know, 20%. So you would really only be responsible maybe for that 20 extra percent, which is kind of small. And if you paid a fee for that, I mean, is that really helping? Probably not. So, so these are like, do we how, how do we encourage more of that green infrastructure so like if you do for example bioretention bioretention requires so let's say we we're trying to do that for single family for example new brand new neighborhoods this is a huge thing because it requires an engineer of media because our soil can't infiltrate and then the hoa would be responsible for maintaining that and they have to bring clean it and replace it and they can't seem to handle dry detention ponds that are just grass very well in certain areas so they don't even know they're in charge of detention ponds in some areas so i think that's a pretty big burden to lay on an hoa um or maybe you know even downtown areas inside the loop so I guess one one option is in a way we are dealing with it with the city flood risk areas. There's 16 of these areas. They're all inside the loop. Um, right now, if it's in like the mapped area, going back to if it's in the orange, you have to deal with it. 
if it's outside the orange, it's draining to the orange, but you don't have to deal with it. So we could just keep expanding those areas or include that entire watershed that drains to the, the area that's flooding. Because right now what we're going to propose is that you only deal with the area that's flooding. So so do we just say, OK, we, we are doing something about this now. With the city flood risk areas and, and, and we know which areas flood. We we're doing detailed studies of additional areas. Do we just worry about those areas and, and try not to make it worse? So that's an option. It's kind of a do nothing option, but I definitely wouldn't say get in the city flood risk area ordinance passed has been a do nothing option because it's, it's been basically gone through the same process and a lot of scrutiny. Um, so, so these are all options. Uh, um, we could do impact fees or, or we could just continue on um, as we're doing now and do nothing. Uh, of what you all are seeing up here, is there anything that really sticks out or that you feel strongly about us taking another look at? Anybody online is also I like all of them except the last two. I think they all deserve a part of discussion except for the fee and the no, other, obviously. Okay. But the others, I think, warrant some you know, additional additional I look. I, I would agree with John. I think I, I think all of the last two seem more reasonable and practical, and especially impact to certain neighborhood sakes. And you could set up arguments across the city from one neighborhood to the other, like who decided I have to pay, and that that would require a lot more foundation to the next time we look at that. But the other ideas I think all could should be continuing to discuss I mean, in some form or another. You know, so the foundation would be like if you had a, an impact fee for a neighborhood, you'd have to have a plan mm -hmm. to resolve flooding mm -hmm. within that neighborhood mm -hmm. so that you know what you're paying into. Or yeah, I mean, the small part, I, I think you'd have to have a lot of solid data to be able to stand up to a certain neighborhood and say, you guys all built a bad neighborhood and you're flooding and so we're going to charge you money. You know, whereas this neighborhood down here, we're not charging them anything. They're lucky they bought into a neighborhood that doesn't flood. I mean, nobody's fault on anything. It's just that would be just a touchy subject, I think. But but unless you had like solid data, like maybe the flooded neighborhoods know they got a problem and they know it's so clear. I don't so I don't know. I don't know how that plays out. What is the money going to do? Yeah, you're paying into it. What? Yeah, and then you're going to say, well, to pay the money, we want it back into this neighborhood. Right? So how long does it take to get the total amount of money? To actually solve your state. Yeah. yeah. You can't just get, yeah, yeah. charge a fee. To charge an impact fee, you say there are necessary improvements. And unfortunately, the way, well, not unfortunately, but legally, no. the way impact fees work, impact fees are assessed due to growth. Mm -hmm. Right. And so water and sewer impact fees and transportation impact fees in the city of Fort Worth, and this is all the state law and the local right. government code, they can't charge for maintenance. Mm -hmm. They can't charge for that line's 40 years old and we need to replace it. Impact fees are, are infrastructure related to growth. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how in an existing neighborhood, how you would make an impact fee fit under the existing state law. Yeah, that uh, specifically. Uh, whereas in, in a new subdivision, you know, it, that, that's growth related. So if you need a new road or, or a new water line or something, or, or, you know, the city has to expand the water plant every five years because of just growth. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what those impact fees all pay for. It's growth related. Mm -hmm. if, if water plant's 50 years old and they need to just redo it, mm -hmm. the city can't charge an impact fee for mm -hmm. the old or undersized or whatever it's, it's, it's uh, other than related to, to growth. So it's a, okay. it probably couldn't charge an impact fee for something like this in existing neighborhoods uh, under the weather of government. So they might fit better with these at all. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it but new developments, like when I'm here, this is not where the issue is. And that's where I was going to go is whatever options we look at, it sounds to me like the, the focus and the issues really in the more older, more urban neighborhoods where it's exacerbated by storm drains that were still designed and built with 30 or 50 or 80 year old criteria and mm -hmm. things like that. And my recommendation would be let's let's focus first on the most important 
you know, what what's the most important goal? What's our highest, you know, and that is what sounds to be these urban flooding, you know, the in the flood prone areas that the city's mapped and, uh, you know, ongoing problems, you know, in various places throughout the city. So focus on the biggest uh, areas of impact first. Yeah. So, so that's kind of what the, yeah, the city risk area, that's kind of it is like, we've identified these to be bad and we don't want people unknowingly putting new things in where that are going to get flooded later. And, and so a, we want to show them that it floods there and then B help them prevent that and prevent others that doesn't tackle the impervious, you know, cumulative impervious, but it's, pretty highly impervious the entire watershed already it's going to get worse we know it's going to get worse even the areas that are pretty bad so uh, of these three is there is there any one that sticks out more than others that like if y'all had to pick one or two top picks what do you what do you think i would make a comment that you're going to do a multi multi-leg approach I think the new development, like you said, that's going to be easier to tackle, which the criteria you put in, whether it's the zoning or like a correction coefficient where you allow some growth factor so they can do whatever they want, but at least you're accounting for it up front. Yeah. Contingency, if you will. Contin like a contingency in part of yeah. yeah. So way instead of telling somebody they can't build, you know, after they've already had their house. But I think the new development is going to be different than the redevelopment. So you're, you're going to have probably two different and I'll say it's an infill initiative, right? Underway right now to actually come up with mm -hmm. how, to, how do we pull that out and how to create maybe potentially a different, for instance, a different development code for in town development because all of your current development ordinances codes are generally written around new, the next suburb out, or not suburb, but suburban type mm -hmm. development within the city. That's really what the development codes are primarily written around. And then the impetus is to rewrite the development, a, a development code within the city to be more um, written more specifically towards redevelopment and 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 word and stuff. And it's I, I honestly it sounds like to me that these probably should be kind of coordinated, certainly coordinated, maybe um, yeah. even become closer to just coordinated. What's your thought on this one to two year, the smaller storm event, if that really addressed with the bigger flood of them? So what was the thought on just So the thought there? on the thought on it's it's capture that first little bit of volume and keep that on site. So so an example of that is I don't know if y'all are familiar with Dr. Uh, Jobber. He's with the Texas AM AgriLife Center. He did a study for City of Dallas where he said, okay, what if everybody in this flood prone area did a rain barrel and captured roughly that? And he showed, you know, maps of how it would improve, right? So that would be like kind of, a, my opinion, unrealistic solution to a watershed wide area. But if a new, let's say, a new uh, apartment complex comes in in a really dense area and it was kind of an open space before, you know, if they could capture that little bit, then that cumulatively, all of those new ones coming in can help like put a dent in the increase that's in volume. So I guess that's the idea. I don't know what the benefit is versus addressing what the hundred do. What's going to happen when? Yeah, yeah. So so that's like all volume, but you'd still have to meet city criteria for peak discharge for the one five and hundred. It just helps with the nuisance storms. This is yeah, that's nuisance storms. So, so does that help with the cumulative? I think that that's the idea. Is it helps with the cum cumulatively? Everybody kind of handles their own as they come in for right. lower storm events. For lower storm events only. Okay, so we are running out of time. That was the last slide. Do do we think? Would we like to meet one more time and kind of finalize the two? Have everyone think over the impervious. Sounds like. Stephen, like zoning and stormwater probably need to have some offline conversations about implications of how we would even do a zoning type one. Stephen, does that sound? Agreed. Accurate? Yeah. 
And I, I want to echo um, what was stated earlier about we already have um, an infill development advisory. I can't remember what they're called, but they're looking at kind of similar things. And I agree we should probably merge whatever's <laughs> happening there with what's proposed here too. Yeah. Merge. Merge. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, so what do you think? This this group, do you think do we need to meet one more time? Do we want to think over options, kind of finalize? Would it be worth kind of one more? Just to work on that last list of them. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that last list. the next step? So, so, so that's great. Next step is if we want to meet, we can finalize. And I think what I would like to do after that is summarize recommendations that came out of you know the the valley storage and the impervious discussions and say this is what we are proposing to go forward for more scrutiny with DAC and other staff and that's when we could continue meeting with if we did propose for example some zoning adjustments that we would meet with zoning and you know that's where those things would kind of be refined but this group's kind of bigger picture this is, we think something needs to be done, and these are three or four good ideas we think need to move forward type thing. So, so then I can I can draft a summary of what we discussed, send it out to everyone to look at, send some comments. I can incorporate those comments and send a final kind of recommendation. And then from there, it's going to kind of work through these different groups uh, to be finalized with the with the. IR to council uh, informal report and and then maybe go go to council and give some recommendations. So that's the idea. And then eventually if if recommendations are approved, they would you know be set in stone in, in the ordinance. So I think I think that's kind of the, how we proceed from here. So it sounds like one more meeting to sort of wrap things up and let everyone kind of think on this impervious options, shoot holes in that and and get back to us so all right i will send out another invite um for the next meeting monday mornings late morning it just seems to be the most open for everybody i wasn't able to schedule the development conference room i'll try to get that next time got more room and but this seemed to work okay with uh several people only being able to join by uh, virtually so just want to thank you all for coming again. Thank you uh, for those who joined online. And uh, I do have a recording of this, so I can send a link out to that as well. So thanks, guys. Thanks, man. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, I'm going to sell this. Ah, I'm going to send it. I guess I'm going to send it. Yeah, same conversation. Okay. 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 Okay.